Okay, last week we began the paragraph of Ve'ahavta es Hashem Elokecho. After we say the Shema, then we say, we proclaim our love for our Kodesh Baruch Hu. And we, we started off with the explanation of Bechoy Lavavecho, which you have to love Hashem with all of your heart. And a very beautiful insight by Shamsin Rafael Hirsch, that as Chazal tells us, Lavavecho with the double base, the two bases that are there, is the two parts of one's heart, which is the Yetzir HaToiv and the Yetzir HaRa, and that we are constantly in flux in this challenge of helping the desires of the Yetzir HaToiv overcome that of the Yetzir HaRa. But we saw amazingly, as he points out, that the Yetzir HaRa itself has a very valuable place and a role in our lives, and that is through its hard work and effort to push against our drives of goodness and of tr- striving for Kedusha and for the things that are right in the eyes of Hashem, the Yitzhahara actually becomes the catalyst for all of our growth here in this world. And since that, that is true, so the, Yitzhah, the Yitzhahara itself is not something that is insidious and evil to the core. As Chazal tell us in the Midrash, it's actually Toiv Ma'id, it's actually very good. Something that helps us to grow and is really the, the main source of our spiritual growth and accomplishment in this world, it's not just good, but it's taiv ma'id, it's very good. And that's the, what we're accepting upon ourselves in this very opening line of the Shema over here, is that I am ready to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu with all of my heart, meaning I'm going to have the Yetzah HaToyv, the positive good inclination inside of me, override the desires of my Yetzahara, and the Yetzahara is going to work on my benefit, on my behalf, to help keeping me moving up and up this ladder of spiritual success. The next two words, which probably will end up taking most of today to speak about, is uvechol nafshecha, which means with all of your soul. I have to love HaKadosh Baruch with all of your heart, and then, ubechol nafshecha with all of your soul as well. Now the Gemara says on this uh, on this pasuk on this line, the Gemara says, bechol levavecha as we mentioned last week, b'shnei yitzirecha. That's talking about you have to love Hashem with both of your inclinations, b'yitzar toiv or the good and the negative inclination. Ubechol nafshecha. What does it mean that you should love Hashem with all of your nefesh? With all of your soul, says the Gemara, even if your soul is being taken away from you, which means even if a person is forced to give up their life, my love of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is so great. My acceptance of the old Machu Shemayim, the yoke of heaven, is so mighty upon myself Therefore, I am willing to give up nafshech of my nefesh. If I'd have to give up my soul for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I would be willing to do that. Now, this obviously is a very great discussion because we hope and we pray that we will never be placed in a situation where we're going to have to give up our souls for the sake of Hashem, proving that we are loyal and allegiant to His Torah. So does that mean that a person then will never fulfill this part of the verse of Shema, that of Bechol Nafshecha, that I'm willing to give up all of my soul for Hashem? The first one, Bechol Levavcha, I live with that every single day, the internal struggle of the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah Taif. That's every day, so for sure I could fulfill that. The next, the line after this is Bechol Meyodecha, we'll see that's all of your resources, all of your means, your money. I could give things up for Hashem. I could spend a little more money on my child's tuition and take away from the family vacation because I'm giving it up for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's what life is all about. But the Chol Navshecha, which means I'm willing to give up my entire soul for the sake of Hashem and His Torah and His mitzvahs, if I live a beautiful, wonderful life, I may have asked Him Shana until 120 years, and I never give up my soul, I'm never threatened to give up my life or choose between HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so then do I ever fulfill the words of the Shema? So this is the question that we should deal with today. How does a person who lives 
we'll call it, quote-unquote, a good life, where there is no external pressures to give up one's soul for the sake of Hashem, how does a person fulfill the dictum of Chazal, of the sages in this matter, that by accepting upon myself the yoke of heaven, and expressing my ava, my great love to Hashem, it means I'm willing to give up my soul, even if I never actually have to give up my soul. So on this, Rav Schwab begins a beautiful explanation in the words of the of the of what it means all of your soul, and he goes upon the following concept, which is that there is something in this world called Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Hashem means sanctifying the name of the Almighty, and there are certain. Uh, mitzvahs, and there are certain situations and scenarios that a person would find themselves in, where in order to sanctify the name of Hashem, they would be obligated to give up their lives in order to fulfill that mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem. The simplest case, as we know, is there are th- there is a concept in the Torah called Chayecha Kaidem, which means your life comes first. Which means the following, the Gemara explains. If a person comes to you, and they would put a gun to your head, and they would say, it's Shabbos today, right? And you say, yes. He says, turn on the light switch, or I'm going to kill you. So the Torah obligates us to turn on the light switch and not get killed. Because Chayecha Kaidim, your life comes first. V'chay Behem, you're supposed to live with the mitzvahs, not die for the mitzvahs. Hashem wants you to live another day so you can do more mitzvahs. So therefore, we're not going to have ourselves killed. We'd be Machal Shabbos, we'll desecrate the Shabbos. Now what if a person comes along and they say to you the following? They pull out a gun and they say, I'm going to shoot you, or you're going to shoot that person over there. And if you don't shoot that person and kill him, I'm going to kill you. On that the Torah says, there are gimel chamuros, there are three cardinal sins that a Jew is never allowed to transgress. And the Maral explains because they are so much the antithesis of the Torah and what it means to be a Jew, you cannot live with yourself after you've committed one of these sins. And that is, shvich damim, if someone asks you to go and kill somebody else, murder. Gil arayis, which means illicit, immoral relations. And the last one being avodah of bowing down to idols or committing some kind of uh, foreign worship besides worshiping Hashem. If a non-Jew would come over to you, pick up the gun and place it in your heart and say, bow down to the idol, I'm going to kill you. You say, I bow down to nobody except Hashem. If you need to kill me, so be it. And so too with illicit relations, if they ask you to do something that the Torah says is immoral and inappropriate behavior for a Jew, you say, I'd rather be killed than to do such a thing. It's not going to happen. In those three, you're obligated to give up your life. That's called, that's called the sanctifi- sanctification of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name. But there is another case that the Gemara discusses, which is also considered Kiddush Hashem, where a person although normally would not be obligated to give up his life, in this particular case they would, be able, they would have to be chayiv, obligated to give up their life. And that's in something called Shas Hashmad. Shas Hashmad means in a time of great peril and danger for the Jewish people, when the nation, a nations or a nation is rising up against us, and they are threatening us merely because we are Jewish. For example, a person, and there are many stories like this, but there's a very famous story, I'm sure that I've told it here before, but it illustrates the point. There was a, a, a very wealthy Israeli-American businessman living in Eretz Yisrael, and he was coming home from work one day, and his wife called him before he left the office, and she said, Joey, do me a favor, can you pick up some dinner on the way home? So he says, sure, no problem. So he stops at their favorite, they live in Tel Aviv. He stops at his favorite treif restaurant where they serve nothing less than chazer in that restaurant. And he's standing in line. It's one of those hot, humid, tropical, late afternoons in Tel Aviv. 
and the heat is oppressive, and he's standing in a long line with other people waiting for to buy their chazer burgers and, and ribs, and he's going through the list in his mind of what he's going to get. He says, I like the chazer hamburger, my wife likes the chazer steak, and my kids love the chazer hot dogs. Okay, then he has the whole menu ready to go. While he's standing there, the heat is beginning to get to him, and he reminds himself of a story that is very famous in their family. And the story is the following. His grandfather was in the concentration camps. And his grandfather was a frum person. And he, served, he was a rabbiner, he was a, he was a rabbinical presence. And he was known as the rabbiner, as the rabbi of that particular part of the camp. The war was coming to an end. The Nazis, Yemach Shemam, knew already that the American Allied forces had come in and they were about to rescue all of the prisoners and they were going to destroy whoever was left amongst the Nazis. The next day, they were going to go free. The Nazis refused to leave the camps until they did one last atrocity and crime. They called the Rabiner, this man, Joey's grandfather, into sight of all the Jews that are standing there in this particular area of the camp. And they said, Rabiner, tomorrow you're going to go free. The Allied forces are coming in. We're running for our lives starting in, a, in, a, in an hour or two. And tomorrow you're going to go free. But before we leave, one thing I need you to do for us. And he pulls out a piece of chazer and he says, I want you to eat the meat. So he says, I was here in this camp already for a couple of years. I ate nothing non-kosher. I'm not going to eat non-kosher right now. So they told him, you don't understand what we're telling you. Either you eat the meat or we're going to kill you. If you eat the meat, tomorrow you're going to go free. If you don't eat the meat, we'll kill you and you will not make it to freedom. So he said, Hashem is my witness. I did not put one morsel of non-kosher food into my mouth. I'm not going to do it now. They tried forcing it in. He refused. And there in front of all the Yidin that were there, they shot him dead. So this grandson, many years later, standing in Tel Aviv in a line to buy Chazer, and he says, one of us is crazy for sure. He says, my grandfather, the old Jew, gave up his life one day before he's about to go free, because he refused to eat a piece of chazer. And I'm standing in line with all the heat and all the everything, and I'm ready to pay with my own money to buy myself chazer. So which one of us is right and which one of us is wrong? To make a very long story short, he ends up finding out about Arachim, which is an amazing organization in Eretz Yisrael for Israelis, to be makar of them, to bring them closer to Yiddishkeit. And he goes to one of their Shabbatons and he realizes all of it is the truth. The Torah is the way that he wants to live his life. And today he is a great supporter of Torah with children and grandchildren all following in the ways of the Torah, all in the schos of a grandfather who refused to eat a piece of meat. Now why did his grandfather do that? We know it says that if, if it's not one of the three major sins, so then you don't have to give up your life. Except that the Gemara explains to us, Shas Hashmad is different. When you're in the time of a, a great, grave danger to the Jewish people, and there are Goyim that are coming to try and destroy the Yiddishkeit from amongst us, if you find yourself in the presence of ten other Jews, you're obligated to give up your life to make what we call a great Kiddush Hashem. And that's why that man did it. And that's our job as well. We have to give up our life for Kiddush Hashem. We say in this verse, I'm willing with all of my avas Hashem, my love of Hashem, and because I accepted upon myself the yoke of heaven, b'chol nafshecho, I'm willing to give up my nefesh, like it says in the Gemara, afilu even, who know to us nafshecho, even if Hashem would come and take away my soul, I'm willing to give it up. Which means what? I'm willing to live a life in this world of tremendous Kiddush Hashem, sanctification and glorification of Hashem's name, because that is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu desires of a Jewish person here in this world. It doesn't mean that I'm going to have to give up my life, because hopefully we pray and we, and we pray that we're never going to be in that situation where we fully have to give up our lives. 
but have, somehow we have to do it here in this world. How are we going to do that? It's called making Kiddush Hashem. Now, Rav Schwab explains in a beautiful way the following. There are two types of, of com- uh, components here in this world, which is the way that we relate between us and Hashem. There is a Naisein and a Makabal. There is a giver and there is a taker. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is always the Naisein, always the giver. He gives us life, He gives us oxygen, He gives us food, He gives our health, He gives our bodies, He gives us our parnas, He gives our, our families, He gives us everything. Adli Dai, there's no end to how much Hashem gives us. And we are always the Makabal, we are always the ones that are accepting all of the goodness from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That itself is something that creates tremendous bonds of ahava, of love between Hashem and the Jewish people. The more that I recognize how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives me, the more overwhelmed I should be by His great chesed, His kindness, and that should fill me up with ahava, with tremendous love for Hashem. That's the normal way that we relate with HaKadosh Baruch However, there is another way that we could have a connection with Hashem. And that is that just like Hashem is the noise and He's the giver, which in another language He's called the mashpia, which means He's the one that is impressing upon us, that is giving over to us, that is influencing us, it's possible for a person to become a mashpia, to be someone that is influencing the world and giving, so to speak, back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in my own way as well. How does a person reach such a level in, in the reality of the world? And he explains the following. That whenever I liken myself to Hashem, which means that my actions create the same environment in this world that Hashem Himself is working to create, then I myself become the mashpi, I become the giver, the influencer, the one that has an impact on the world, just like HaKadosh Baruch Himself has. So which means what? Just like Hashem's mission in this world is to fill up the world with His Kedusha, with His holiness, with His Shechina, with His Bracha, with His glory. Whenever I myself find a way to increase the Kedusha and the Shechina here in this world, so through my actions, I'm now becoming the Mashbia, I'm the giver, I'm the influencer, I'm the one that's impacting the world, not the one that is merely just sitting here and being a makabal, being someone that is receiving and accepting. How does a person become a mashpia? So that's the chiddush, that's the insight that he has. That is when a person is living a life of kiddush Hashem, when a person is living a life where he's sanctifying HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name in this world, then I am bringing the Shechina down to this world. Then I am bringing the Kedusha into the, into the elements that I live in. Now I'm, br- I'm filling up the world with Hashem's glory, so I no longer am just a taker for myself. I am a Mashbiya, I'm having a positive impact on the world at large. And that's what it means, as we're saying over here, to make a great Kiddush Hashem. To make a Kiddush Hashem means you don't have to give up your life, but you have to be willing to give up your life. And what it means in our own life is, as it says in the as it says in the Apostolic in Tehillim, Ki alecho hiragnu kol ayoyim. David HaMelech says, we are killed for your sake every day. What does that mean, we are killed for your sake every day? We're killed? We're right here. How do we get killed every day? Because I'm willing to give up my soul every single day. I'm willing to do what it takes to be Mekadah Shem Shemayim. I'm ready to make that difference in this world, to be a mashpi, to be a giver, instead of the Mekabah, the regular taker that I usually am. And therefore, even when I'm not removed physically from this world, 
but I'm still here, but I'm living my life where I'm giving up certain things for the sake of making a greater Kiddush Hashem in this world, that's the living Kiddush Hashem that a person is going to become in their lives. And um, this we find in the Gemara, in the Gemara in Bracha says the following story with Rabbi Akiva. Gemara says like this, it says that it was the times of Shas Hashmad, it was the Romans were coming in, and the wicked Romans, and they were, anyone that was caught teaching Torah publicly, they were sentenced to death. And we know the famous story, we recited twice during the year on Yom Kippur, and we recited also on Tisha B'Av. And this is the ten martyrs of the Jewish people, amongst them Rabbi Akiva, they were all the greatest Tanoim, the greatest sages of the Mishnah and the Talmud, and their only crime was that they were tzaddikim. They were tzaddikim who lived a life completely mustered, totally given over to the will of Hashem, and for that they were, they were painfully killed, each one in their own gruesome way. So the Gemara begins to describe the last moments of Rebbe Akiva's life. And the Gemara says the following, at the time that they took Rabbi Akiva out to be murdered, Zman Kriyashma Haya. Lo and behold, it happened to be the time, the opportune time to recite the Kriyashma, which is everything that we're discussing over here. And they took out these metal combs and they began scraping, combing away the flesh of Rabbi Akiva. Now what is Rabbi Akiva doing? He's screaming? Crying? What's he doing? He accepted upon himself the Ol Malchus Shemaim. He was saying Shema. As we're discussing, he started saying Shema. They're ripping his body to shreds. He's in excruciating pain. He's in his final moments of life. Instead of, instead of crying, instead of screaming and, and complaining, he began to say Kri Shema. So his students are there. They're watching in front of their eyes. They could have just imagined something. I'll tell you a story in a moment. But just imagine, you're watching your revered and beloved tzaddik leader, Rebbe, leader of all of Klaus, Rebbe Kiva, being destroyed in front of your eyes. And the students said, Amr Talmida, Rabbeinu, Ad Khan. They said, Rebbe, our teacher, our master, until here, you're still saying, Krishma, you're dying right now. You're saying, Krishma, accepting upon yourself the yoke of heaven. Amalahem, he said to them, Koyomai Hayisi Mitzdaya Posik Zen. All of my life, there was one Posik, there was a verse in the Shema that always pained me. Bechol Nafshecha. It says, with all of your soul, Afilu Noitel Nishmosai, Biech, Biech, I'm sorry, Afilu, Afilu, um, Afilu Noitel is Nishmosai, Nishmosecha, even if they take away your soul you're obligated to love HaKadosh Baruch Hu and accept His sovereignty upon you. Amarti Rabbi Kiva said, I said to myself, Mosa Yovoi Liyodi, when is this time going to come to my life? Ve'kameno, and I'm going to be able to fulfill the dictum of Chazal and say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I love you so much. I accept upon myself to the highest level O Malchus Shemayim, I'm willing to give up my life. And now that the time has finally come, that I'm giving up my soul for being a Yid, giving up my Neshama because I was teaching Torah, being made a public spectacle because I'm one of the leaders of Klal Yisrael who says, more valuable than anything in the world is a Jew that's sitting and learning Torah. And now I have a chance to give up my soul by accepting the, whole, the, the yoke of heaven upon me? And I'm not going to do it. Marich says the Gemara, Hayamarich be'echad. He started saying, Shema Yisrael Hashem, Lagim Hashem Echad. The word one, Echad. Atsh Yitzasa Nishmasai be'echad. Until his Neshama left him with the word Echad. 
was one. Kodesh Baruch accepting the unity and the oneness of Hashem. Yitzasa Baskoil, a heavenly voice rang out from the heavens. Va'omra Ashrecha Rebbe Akiva. Fortunate are you, Rebbe Akiva. Shiyasa Yinishmasecha Be'echad. That your neshama left this world by saying the word echad, by saying the word one. Before I explain on this Gemara, how was Rabbi Akiva under these circumstances able to be holding cup, as we say, to be able to be so clear and so lucid? His life is coming to an end. He's not going to see another, another ray of sun for the rest of his life. He's there, everybody's standing around him and they're torturing him beyond belief. How is he able to be so settled in his mind with such manuchas anevis, such peacefulness and clarity to know that this is what HaKadosh Baruch wants? Because every single day when Rabbi Akiva said, Shema Yisrael Hashem, Elokein Hashem Echad, he thought to himself, Bechol nafshicha, even if they give up my life, I'm ready to give up my life for the sake of our Kodesh Baruch Hu. Every day he imagined to himself, I'm giving up, I'm giving up, I'm giving up my life. Because that's what our Kodesh Baruch Hu wants. Like it says in this posting in the Hillel that we quoted, our, um, it's like it says, Kol alecha iragnu, ki alecha iragnu kol ayoyim. All day long, I'm being killed. Every day. Which is every day Rabbi Kiva put himself in a situation, where even though he was here in this world, even though he was alive, he was teaching, he was growing, he was spreading the light of Torah to the world, he felt when he would say the Shema that he's giving himself up for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch. And that way when it comes, in an instant Rabbi Kiva is ready to give over whatever it takes for the sake of Hashem. This is our duty here when we're saying the Krishna, as I saw in the Rabbeinu Mechaya writes, on this passage, B'chol Nafshecha, Hi HaNefesh HaMisave. The Nefesh HaMisave is the soul that has great desire. If you have a Neshama, a Nefesh that desires HaKadosh Baruch Hu so much to be close to Him, you, are, you would be willing to do anything that it takes to get closer to the Rebbein Nishayim. So if it means, like Chazal say, I have to be willing to give up my life, then I will give up my life. If it means I have to give up some of my comforts, I'll give up some of my comforts. If it means I have to give up some of my sleep or my time, that's what I'll do. Look at all the maizim of the great Gedele Yisrael. The whole life was nefesh, mis'ava, was in the shama that would desire HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And this Torah, they gave up everything. All of the comforts of Olam Haze of this world, all of the pleasures of this world, all the hours and the warmth of the, of the fuzzy pillows and the sleep, they gave it all up for the sake of Nefesh Mis'ava, because the Neshama had such a, a taiva, such a desire to be close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that itself is Kiddush Hashem. When I am ready to give up my own comfort or my own things here in this world for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that already makes Kiddush Hashem. Now I make a Kiddush Hashem, I'm no longer a person that is a Mechabal, that I'm just receiving all of the goodness from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When I push myself for the sake of Hashem, I now am becoming the one that is ready to mashpia, to give over, to have a hashpa, to have a very positive and a lasting effect here on this world. And that's what Rav Schwab is explaining here. What does it mean? It means that when I make myself to a great extent like the Rebbe Nisha'ilam, and Hashem's whole point is to fill up the world with His glory, which is Kiddush Hashem, I now become the vehicle of Kiddush Hashem to fill up this world with His glory as well. He tells over a beautiful mice over here, a beautiful story. There was, um, there was a bocher, who learned in the Frankfurt Yeshiva. His name was Meir, and he was, he was a Baal Tshuva, and eventually he died al Kiddush Hashem at the hands of the Nazis. But he was once, before he, was, before he died, he was once approached by a Nazi. And the Nazi demanded of him to pronounce the name of Hashem, to say Hashem's name, and to attach to it some obscene word along with it. And of course, this young Bacher, he refused. And so the Nazi got upset and he pulled out his revolver 
and he put the gun right next to his heart, and he began screaming at him, and he says to him, "Will you will you do it? Will you say it, yes or no?" So this young man, Mayor Bachar Balchuva boy, screams with all of his strength, "No!" The Nazi takes his revolver puts it back in his holster, and he said, I just wanted to find out if you were a Jewish coward or not. And he walked away. So Schwab points out that the Nazis, who he, he calls the lowest scum of the earth, in their insidious and their evil ways, they became the vehicles that HaKadosh Baruch Hu used in this world to bring about some of the most triumphant moments of Kiddush Hashem that Klal Yisrael had seen in thousands and thousands of years and which has not been seen since then. Because so many of the Yidin who were put in these situations, they were willing to give up their lives rather than bow out in cowardly in, in cowardness to the demands of the Nazis because as they knew, giving up one's life in a public display in front of other Yidin, that is called Kiddush Hashem. That's called sanctifying and glorifying HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name. And that's when he says over here the following. We have to say every day, We have to love HaKadosh Baruch Hu with all of our nefesh. Which means we are showing to HaKadosh Baruch Hu at this time when we say these words, that no matter what is going to happen in my life, I am accepting on myself the yoke of heaven, I am acknowledging HaKadosh Baruch as the master of the universe, that the Torah is all true, and that whatever it says in the Torah that a Jew has to do, I'm willing and I'm ready and able to do. And when a person makes a firm resolution, that I will be willing publicly to make any Kiddush Hashem, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants me to do, if the need will arise, then it is considered as if he already offered up his life for Kiddush Hashem in this world. Because as we know the famous words of Chazal, Machshav Toiva HaKadosh Baruch Hu Maisa. When a Jew has a good idea, he has a, 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 an idea, a thought to do something positive, to do a mitzvah, and one reason or another he is withheld from being able to do that mitzvah. So if it was against his will that he was not able to finish or perform the mitzvah, the fact that he had the thought is as if he did the mitzvah itself. This, I think I told last year, but, uh, last year, two years ago, when, um, last year, when the four martyrs were, were killed in the shul in Harnof, one of them was of Moshe Chworsky, that's all. And he was a, a very, very big Talmud Chacham, a very special tzaddik of a person. And many, many stories became revealed about him after he died. But one of the things that was unusual, that was information that kept coming up from many different people, was that he spoke often about the mitzvah of dying al Kiddush Hashem. It wasn't like just give a shir about it, close the book, and go on. He would speak to people, and he had drushes that he would tell over to people about the great schos that a person has to die, al pi kiddush Hashem, to die while they're sanctifying Hashem's glorious name. And his brother spoke over, I think at the shiva, at the end of shiva, that because that his brother of Moshe Chorsky was so medactic, so particular about performing all of the mitzvahs, which he was, it was known that he was very meticulous about mitzvahs, he wanted to perform every mitzvah in the best possible way, for him, it wasn't enough just to know what it meant to die al Kiddush Hashem. It wasn't enough just to learn about it, to speak about it, to inspire others to live a life of Kiddush Hashem. The only way that you could fulfill the mitzvah of dying al Kiddush Hashem, actually, is if you would die while sanctifying Hashem's name and was brought down afterwards that there are many different levels of dying al Kiddush Hashem. There's one when you are, you cause to give up your life merely because you're a Jew, and then there's merely because you are a Jew who's involved with a mitzvah and you give up your life, 
And then there is, it was brought down after his death, that there's a, written someplace in the, in, in, the, in the Kabbalah, that if you give up your life, because you're a Jew, and you're doing a mitzvah, and the mitzvah you're doing is, Davni Shmon Esrei, so that itself is one of the highest levels of dying al Pikidish Hashem that you could possibly leave this world for. And that's exactly what happened to him. He was a Yid, in a shul, davening shachris, and he was in the midst of the Shmon Esrei, of his silent prayers to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that's how he lost his life. So, when you live your whole life, and that's what his wife said afterwards, people were saying, Oi, what a terrible way to go. She said, I guarantee you, my husband has no regrets with the way that he left this world. Because he lived a life of Kiddush Hashem, and he is prepared always to give up his life for Kiddush Hashem, and that's the way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw it. There was nothing. I just saw, I just, saw just before this class, a story that, that one of this horrible stabbing that took place in Eretz Yisrael a few, a few days ago, where this terrorist came into the, into the uh, Atniel, came, in, came into this house and was looking for victims. And the mother happened, I don't know, she was up, she heard the noise, whatever it was. So she went, she went into the face of, the, of, this, uh, of this attacker, however exactly it worked, and he began stabbing her. And the, she was screaming. And the daughter, the older daughter, 16 or 17 years old, woke up and she sees, maybe her mother saw a rat, maybe she saw a bug or something. Her mother would do things like that when she would see these things. And she looks and she sees that her mother is being stabbed by this, by, this, by this animal. And she notices that the mother is holding the knife into her in order that the attacker, the terrorist, cannot pull the knife out of her and finish off her and then go kill her children as well. So the mother, in her final moments, understand the level, in her final moments of life, she had enough consciousness and enough awareness, which means that she was living Shema, she was living Michal Nafshecha, she was aware that this guy is a maniac and he can go and kill the rest of the house as well. She was holding the knife inside of her so he couldn't remove it and go and kill somebody else. And by the time that the oldest daughter realized what was going on, she began screaming and screaming and screaming. And they called the police right away and the man ran out of the house and the rest of the children, the rest of the family was saved. So this is the kind of a life, again, we should never be in such situations. We should never know what it means that we would have to be given a choice between life and death because, merely because we are Jews. But, what the Chazal, the Mepharshim are telling us over here is that you could live this life of Bechol Naf even while you're here in this world. If you're willing and you're able to divulge yourself of things that you are clinging on to and holding on to because that's what you think you need, but it's nisht, it's not. It's not the Ratzon Hashem. It's not a Kodesh Baruch Hu's wish. It's not what a Kodesh Baruch Hu wants for Kiddush Hashem. Then you here in this world, you can make the greatest Kiddush Hashem possible. And I'll just leave off with a, um, a one last Maisa that even the Jew in the most Rochek, the farthest, farthest away from his understanding of what it means to die up Kiddush Hashem, there was a, uh, there was a, in the, I think it was in, in Poland during the war, there was a, a Jewish mayor of the particular town. His name was uh, uh, Gr- uh, Genshkro or something. I have to find out the exact name. Genshkro. And uh, he was the governor of the town. And he married Shiksi. He married a non-Jewish lady. And he lived a life, nothing at all to do with Yiddishkeit at all. The Nazis came into town and they began taking everything over. And of course, as they did everywhere they went, they always wanted to show that there was no Kedusha amongst the Jewish people. They would take over the shul, the main shul in town, and that would become their headquarters. So they sent a summons for the mayor, who they knew was Jewish. But they also knew that he was living a life with nothing at all to do with Judaism. And they sent a message that they wanted to see him. And he comes to the main shul with his wife, the non-Jewish lady, and they walk in, and they say, Genshkro, we know that you are here, you're the governor of this town, and we're going to need your help a lot. We need your help over here. 
But we just one thing we need to know from you. Because we know that you're really Jewish. We know your wife is not Jewish. You don't live like a Jew. But, you know, the rules of the Nazis are, if you're a Jew, you're a Jew. But if you'll denounce your Judaism completely, then we'll have no problems working together with you and allowing you to keep, keep your life and your family and being governed in this town. So they had started a fire on the ground and they walked over to the Aron Kaidish and they pulled out a Sefer Torah and they told him, Genshko, take this Torah of the Jewish people and throw it into the fire. And that way we'll know that you are not, you are, you're not with your people, that you're with us. The man had nothing to do with Yiddishkeit for 20, 30 years of his life. He's holding the Sefer Torah in his arms and he cannot bring himself to throw it into the fire. So they said, again, throw the Sefer Torah into the fire, show us that you are not with the Jewish people, and you'll be working together with us. If you don't throw the Sefer Torah into the fire, we are going to throw you into the fire together with the Sefer Torah, and that will be the end of your life. And he's standing there, and he's paralyzed. He cannot throw the Sefer Torah into the fire. His wife, the shiksa, is standing next to him. She's telling him, Genshko, what are you doing? You don't do anything Jewish in your life. Throw the Torah in there. And then he looks at the Nazis and his wife, and he says, Kenisht, I cannot. Ich bin a Yid, I'm a Jew. And a Yid would not throw a Sefer Torah into the fire. I cannot. And they pick him up together with the Sefer Torah, and they throw him into the fire. And that's how he loses his life. Kiddush Hashem. Could never imagine, like Chazal tell us, some people, they receive the reward in the world to come, B'Sha'achas, in one moment. A man lives a life, his whole life. Nothing to do with Yiddishkeit, but at the last moment, he's willing to go Kiddush Hashem, to give up his life for the sanctity and the glory of Hashem. So that's what we're saying, over B'chol Nafshecha means, that, again, I don't have to be put into the situation where they're taking away my life. But I am living in this world with such a desire to be Kiddush Hashem in the way that I treat people, the way that I act towards people, the way that I conduct my business affairs, the way that I run my household, the way that I treat my wife, the way that I raise my children, the way that I go shopping in the market, the way that I dress on the streets, the words that come out of my mouth. Somebody once told me, a Froom guy tells me that he was, he was walking down the street on Shabbos. This is a guy in a hat, sits at the whole thing. He's walking down the street on Shabbos, and he's, a guy, rolls, a guy a car comes driving by, rolls down his window, and he starts yelling obscenities at this Froom Jew on Shabbos as he's walking down the street. So the man's sitting here in shul, and he begins telling us the story. And I was like, oh boy, that's terrible, it's terrible. So we assumed, okay, so like most of us would do, we just keep walking on. She says, yeah, but I got him back. Really? Well, you got him back? What did you do? I yelled back the same words right to him. Not a kiddush Hashem. A from Jew loses it. I was just in, in uh, New York. Funny place. I was just in New York, and... Um, People that like to honk their horns. And if it was only the non-Jews that were honking the horns, it would be okay. But when you're in a neighborhood where 99% of all the people are beards, payas, and the like, so, and the horns are honking, there's only one person that's honking the horns, it's all the Jewish people. So there were my, we got in early in the morning, and uh, my son was exhausted. And uh, we got to a hotel, and he went to lay down for sleep. And it was going very peaceful for about two hours. After two hours, there was a honking match out, outside on the street, right in front, below our window where we were. And one horn goes, ah, ah, and then the other one starts honking back, ah, and it was a higher pitch horn, and they're going back by about a minute and a half. There's just two cars honking at each other, and that was the end of my son's rest when we got to New York. But the, the last night that we were there... We're walking down the street, and suddenly we hear honking and honking and honking, and we hear brakes, and we look up, and a guy jumps out of his car in the middle of the intersection. From guy, imagine this is a religious person. Religious person jumps out of his car, 
and there is a school bus which is taking kids home at the end of the day. And the school bus was honking him because they felt, I guess, he was going too slow through the intersection. He stops going to the intersection, he gets out of his car, and he starts screaming. Now, I don't want to say what I think that I heard because I wouldn't believe that a front person would say such a thing out loud. He's pointing his finger and he's screaming at the bus driver. Now, maybe there's little kids that are on that bus as well. He's screaming and screaming and screaming. And the whole street is just there watching this person do what he's doing. And then, in great anger, he gets, jumps back in the car and he drives off. This is Kiddush Hashem. This is not the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to live our lives. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, you get upset in traffic, someone's going too slow, somebody's hungry. Just... Kiddush Hashem. I'm not here to be angry and to hurt people and all these things. And that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's what we're saying over here. Shema Yisrael Hashem Belkei Hashem Echad. I'm accepting the yoke of heaven in my life, and I'm willing with all the ava, with the great love that I have of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. I give Echol Olavav Echad my heart, which is Yitzah Har Yitzah Hara Yitzah Toiv. But now the next level, which is a higher level, is Echol Nafshecha. If I can't do it in this world, I'm willing to give up everything I have for the sake of my whole nefesh, my whole life. And merely by having that kavana, having that in mind while I'm saying it, sitting in my, in my house or sitting in the shul, that itself is considered in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu as if I gave up my life for Hashem. And then I become someone that's bringing Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of Hashem's name in this world, and I'm mashpia, I'm giving into this world, I become more like HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Rav Schwab can, concludes and he says... When you are a makabal, when you're accepting, so it's a lesser level of the relationship that you have with Hashem. When you're a mashpir, when you're also giving and you're having an influence here in this world, like Hashem Himself, you're becoming more like HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then you get closer to Hashem. So Kiddush Hashem, we'll see next week, in Yitz Hashem, the highest level, but Kiddush Hashem is, by doing that, I'm uniting myself together with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And then, like in the words of Rabbi Akiva, Zacha, he was Zacha to his Nishmasa Yatsa, the word Echad with one, we become one with the Rebbein Nishayim.